please turn the floor over to Ken. Let's see, where did Ken go on my list? Ken, are you still are you still there? I'm I'm here. Okay, I need I'm trying to find your name on the on the webinar list. Um, pardon me, it's taking a little longer than I thought. Um, and then uh, I'll okay, I'm gonna turn I'm gonna start your presentation, um, and I'm gonna try to turn the floor over to you. But in the meantime, I have to read just a brief introduction um, about Ken Clark. So. Dr. Ken Clark is a research forester with the USDA Forest Service at the Silas Little Experimental Forest in New Lisbon, New Jersey. He received his undergraduate and master's degrees from Humboldt State University in Northern California and his PhD from the University of Florida in forest ecology. In addition to today's topic, Dr. Clark has conducted research on nutrient cycling in tropical montane cloud forests of Costa Rica, carbon and energy exchange in pine-dominated forests of Florida, carbon and nutrient cycling in semi-arid ecosystems in northern Patagonia, Argentina. When not conducting fire science research, you may find Ken surfing or skiing in an exotic locale or riding a fat bike through the sands and snows of New Jersey's Pinelands. Um, without further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Ken Clark. And I'm trying to find your name on the list, so I can give you the floor, Ken. Uh, there you are. Okay. Giving the floor. Ken, you now have the floor. Great. Thank you. Okay, what I would like to talk about today is, is recent fire research topics um, that we've been, all of us have been working on here uh, at the Silas Little Experimental Forest. Um, and uh, I want to acknowledge first my co-authors, Nick and Mike, of course. And then my subtitle here is things that we should not know more about but don't yet. And so there's a few topics here that are, are sort of open questions, and so I wanted to cover things that were really new, sort of our newest projects, and 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 acknowledge that we haven't quite uh, solved some of these uh, yet, of course. Um, I have a few thanks due, and first of all, I want to thank New Jersey Forest Fire Service for just invaluable assistance through the years, and pretty much this would not even be a talk without their assistance, and they, uh, so I really want to acknowledge them. Um, a few people I want to acknowledge, uh, Warren Heilman, uh, NRS 06, our group, uh, Eric Mueller and Albert Simeone uh, from the University of Edinburgh, and then Matt Ayers and Carissa Akoy from Dartmouth, and that's the people I've been working on with the Southern Pine Beetle work. Uh, I would like to acknowledge for funding Joint Fire Sciences Program, and then also the U.S. Forest Service uh, Forest Health and Monitoring. Okay, so with that, Here's what I want to talk about today. Um, first, uh, energy flux and turbulence measurements in the fire environment. Uh, secondly, the impacts of southern pine beetle and gypsy moth on hazardous fuel loads and fire danger in the pinelands. Uh, and thirdly, uh, a really neat project that, that Mike's been working on, which is remote sensing methods to evaluate fire severity and uh, tree mortality in pineland forests. Okay. Um, this is our Inga up on a tower, and she's contemplating. I don't know if this keeps her up or night, but at night, but maybe it does. What do we know about energy exchange and turbulence during fires? And we we were going to just leave her up there, but uh, you know there was something about a husband and kids and things like that, so she had to come down, and we had to work on it. Um, I realized that it's sort of late in the week for equations, but but. I, I don't have a lot of equations, but I do want to just take a look at, at, a, at a few. Um, and this is how you express the energy balance of a forest, um, where our net is the net radiation, and that's solar radiation coming in minus reflected radiation. And that's partitioned as latent heat flux, which would be water vapor uh, being released. Uh, sensible heat flux, and that's uh, what's happening is that the shortwave radiation coming in as light is being degraded and then re-radiated as heat, and we can, we can measure that. It's called sensible heat flux. A smaller portion of the energy goes to the soil, so that's the, the soil heat flux. There's, at least on short term, there's some storage in the ecosystem, and that's in the air mass, in the canopy airspace, and in the biomass. And then Q would be 
basically all the other things that we missed and some variability in the measurement. Um, and this is all expressed as, as watts per meter squared. So this is a, this is a, a unit that's, that's usually used to, uh, to look at forest energy balances like this. Okay, a picture, what does this look like? Um, well, coming in is the solar radiation, and that's, of course, the sun in the upper, upper left. Uh, and that's 100% uh, coming in. Um, a portion of that is, is re-reflected, so that would be albedo. And that's somewhere between 10 and 20%. But on a snowy forest like this, it would actually be a little bit higher. The balance between those is the net radiation. And then uh, moving towards the right, uh, some of that energy is used to evaporate water, and that would be evaporation or, or transpiration if it's coming through leaves. Uh, so the process together would be evapotranspiration. Uh, then the sensible heat flux, and under winter conditions, that sensible heat flux is usually much larger than the evaporation because of the lower leaf area. Um, then there's a heat storage term, and then the soil heat flux, and so just to sort of ID uh, what these look like uh, in, in real life here. Amanda, can you hear this? Yes, I can hear it. I just had put myself okay. on mute, so this is great. Just, just checking. Okay. Um, how do we measure these things? Well, a real workhorse for us is a sonic anemometer, and what this measures is three-dimensional wind speeds, so this is U, V, and W, um, at 10 times per second. So the eddies that are, that are moving uh, energy and water vapor uh, above a forest are, all, are happening at quite high speeds sometimes, and so we need to, to have meteorological data that captures the, the turbulent structure of these eddies, of these movements of of wind and, and water vapor and CO2 and things like that through the, the, the atmosphere above a forest at, at high speeds. So that 10 hertz is 10 times per second. Um, another number that, that or another uh, data information that's provided from a sonic anemometer is air temperature at 10 times per second. And we're going to use that to calculate uh, the sensible heat flux or that, that, that additional long wave energy that's being released uh, from, from the uh, following the absorption of, of solar radiation. Um, on the right is just a picture of, of a sonic anemometer. There's one down low. Um, above me, there's another one up high. Then there's a box that's containing data loggers. And in some towers, we have uh, water vapor analyzers, CO2 analyzers that run uh, rapidly and we're, we're collecting air from very close to that, to that open air uh, space on the sonic anemometer. Then we have air temperature, relative humidity, uh, radiometers, various other measurements to, uh, to uh, make these, these uh, energy balance measurements. And if we're good at anything, we're good at building towers. And so um, these are just some of the towers that we've constructed that, that Nick and Mike and I have constructed through the years. Uh, in the Pine Barrens. Uh, some of these are still up and running. Some were just temporary. We took them back down. Um, I counted uh, since we started here uh, in uh, about 2003. Um, so far, we've built 19 above canopy towers and uh, something on the order of about 25 understory towers, all in various configurations. And so that's, you can just see some of those. And again, some of these are still up. Some we, we're just temporary towers. We took them back down. Uh, but we're uh, pretty good at building towers, I guess. Um, this is what the data looks like. Um, and this is over a 24-hour period during the entire growing season. And what I've done is I've just averaged data within a growing season um, for each half hour. And on top, you can see the solar radiation. So that's the, the large amount of, of solar radiation coming in. Uh, and then below that is net radiation. So that, that about 15 to 20 percent re-reflected back out. Um, this is on the left is pre is a pre-fire. So this is before a prescribed burn was conducted in this stand. You can see that the latent heat flux is the third largest term here, then sensible heat, then the soil heat flux. 
if you look at the post burn, there's a slightly different pattern, and the balance between latent energy and sensible heat flux is different, and latent heat is much lower. What's happened is there's lower leaf area because there was some crown scorch in this burn and the understory is recovering, so there's lower leaf area. Um, and there's also a proportionately higher sensible heat flux and a considerably higher soil heat flux. So that black soil is heating up and that energy is coming down into the, into the forest floor. Now this mic is gonna, is in, in what I'm gonna present later in the talk, is Mike is going to pick up on this, and he's going to use the differences in the pre-burn and post-burn condition to actually uh, using satellite data to uh, work out uh, burn intensity in, in wildfires and prescribed burns using the reduced leaf area and the higher heat flux being given off in a post-fire compared to pre-fire condition. Pretty, pretty neat trick. Um, if you look at the whole year, okay, so this is the annual energy balance of, of that pitch pine scrub oak stand, um, we can actually account for a lot of the energy so that we've accounted for at the top, you can see there's a 96%. We actually can account with our measurement for uh, about 96% of the energy balance. Um, and that's shown in the available energy. You sort of rearrange that equation a little bit that I, that I showed previously. So again, you have the net radiation, the soil heat flux, and then storage, and those should add up um, to the, the total of what you're getting from the sonic anemometer and the, and the water vapor sensor, so sensible and latent heat flux. We can actually close this pretty well. So I, you know, I thought, wow, this is, this is, uh, this is, this is good. This, is, this means that our measurements are probably valid and we're doing a pretty good job of energy balance measurements without, in, in the absence of a fire. Okay, let's put a fire in the mix. Sorry, second equation, um, that's it for equations. Um, so the energy balance of a fire or budget of a fire can be expressed as the change in fuel times the effective heat of combustion. And so that's the energy, the total energy release from that fire. Some of that is consumed some of that energy is consumed as, as a preheating and a pyrolysis. Okay, that's a fairly small term. Um, some is a radiative heat flux, and so that's the, the bright light, the, the, the shortwave radiation being given off from that, from that fire. There's actually a large amount of water vapor being released, the latent heat flux, and it's, it's evaporation of the water that's in the fuels that are consumed, and it's also because of combustion and any heating and release of, of other fuels that aren't consumed but are heated up enough to release water. So that gets pretty complex. Um, then uh, the, the, the convective heat flux in the buoyant plumes, those are the, the, the large amounts of, 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 uh, of heat that's given off uh, from, a, from a fire, then that's what's, of course, moving um, a lot of the smoke and the water vapor is this expansion of, of hot air uh, moving above. And we can actually measure that partially as sensible heat flux. Um, and then there's a, uh, a soil heat flux. So that heating of the fire is also going to heat uh, lower soil levels. Um, and a lot of it, uh, Bob Kremens, who we also work with, who I probably should have acknowledged because we've learned a lot from him, um, uh, Bob Kremens published a paper in 2012 that really expresses this nicely, and I've actually used some of his values, particularly for the preheating and for the radiative heat flux. He's, he's actually made a series of very nice radiative heat flux measurements um, here. Okay, I'm going to put all these as a, as a different unit, as a kilojoule per meter squared, but that's related to watts per meter squared, because what I can do is if I take joules per meter squared, remember this is, you know, this is from basic physics, everybody, I guess, um, is that a watt per second per meter squared is a joule per meter squared. Okay, so these are related energy budget terms, energy balance terms. Okay, just again, let's, let's take a look. What, what does this really mean? So the delta fuel in the lower left corner, that is the fuel that's consumed times the heat of combustion 
some of that energy is is consumed in preheating and pyrolysis of the fuels. Um, some, and on the average, about 15 to 25 percent is released as the radiant heat. Um, then, depending on what the water moisture, the fuel moisture content is, that latent heat flux associated with the fire is in the center, and then the larger convective heat flux, and that convective heat flux is, is usually the largest uh, flux in a fire. Well, can we measure these things? Can we actually take our instruments out that we're using for energy balance measurements and, and try to try to, to actually quantify fires? Um, so we did that, and this, this was with the help of Scotty Nauer from New Jersey Forest Fire Service. Um, if you look in the center of the picture, there's actually a flux tower in the background there. Um, and and we've, he's, we've, with New Jersey Forest Fire Service, he's uh, conducting an operational prescribed burn right under our flux tower. And on the, the right is shown what, what, we, what we collected. Um, in terms of net radiation, we didn't really capture, at least at the top of the tower, much in the terms of a radius heat flux, but he's really, we're not really using the right sensor to do that. Um, uh, so, that so that we're now, in the, now just starting to work a bit more with, uh, with Bob and seeing if we can improve our estimates of radiative of heat fluxes. What we did get, though, was a much higher sensible heat flux um, right there, and a much higher latent heat flux right there compared to control towers. So we had control towers running on the landscape, and then we measured these much higher peaks um, during the fire. You can see these are these, these fires took a little while, and they were picking up plumes or or at least higher fluxes that were associated with uh, um, with with nearby fires. So it wasn't just right under the tower. It was it was actually I impacting um, both the sensible and the latent heat fluxes sort of throughout the throughout the burn period. So on the order of about four to six hours. Okay, this is what we ended up with. And so both the preheating and the radiated heat flux, those are the bars at the bottom, uh, are are estimated across the board. Um, on the bar on the left side underneath pine oak is the estimated, and the bar on the right is the, is the actual measured, um, what, what we've measured for three different fires. Um, and I have this, the, the storage term and the soil heat flux in a box above that because it is a flux. But this is one of these things that I, we haven't quite, I haven't quite figured out how you don't double count the storage term as opposed to the, to the sensible heat flux. And so I'm still kind of struggling with, um, like I said early, something we didn't know about. Um, uh, I'm still struggling with how do, you, how do you not double count this, but how do you count it? So we know it's a flux, and we, and we, and we, we have some values for it, but we're not, we're not quite sure exactly how this works. Um, but what we are doing is, at least in these data sets, we're accounting for about uh, about 80 percent of the energy. Um, once we work out sort of reasonable storage terms, and I think uh, the, the soil heat flux is going to be up around 90 percent of, of the energy that balances that we can that we can measure in uh, in these fires. Um, that's that's pretty exciting. I mean, because now you kind of start to believe your measurements. Um, maybe maybe we're actually able to quantify these things during a really rigorous environment. I mean, we are we are pushing all of these sensors to their limits uh, during these fires. All right, I want to switch gears a little bit, um, and I want to look at some hotter fires on some smaller burn blocks. And this is some work that we've been doing uh, fairly recently with Joint Fire Sciences. Um, and, uh, and, and uh, Warren Heilman, um, Eric Mueller, and, and, and Albert Simeone. And what, what we've been doing is um, we have a network of three towers within the burn block, and that's shown in the orange uh, and, and uh, uh, yellow triangles, and then a control tower immediately nearby um, shown in blue. And these are 
40 foot towers with a sonic anemometer on top and then a, an array of fine wire thermocouples uh, uh, up and down the, the tower. And then these were hot enough fires that the data loggers and the, bear, and, and the batteries, we had to bury because um, we were really concerned about, about uh, you know, these were, these were hot uh, head fires that we were working on in these blocks. Um, here's what the, what the fuel load looked like. And it was relatively homogeneous fuels um, dense shrubs, uh, ladder fuels, low pitch pine uh, scrub oak canopies. So just, just the kind of thing that could burn pretty intensely in, in the in the pinelands. Um, and this is afterwards. Uh, you can see the tower. And this is uh, this is after we pulled the data logger up. But you after you have conducted a burn like this, and you're sort of coming over to the tower, just wondering if anything's even left on it because. Um, uh, but things were, and, and there actually was quite a bit of data. And so what I want to go through is some data that makes a lot of sense for these burns and some that is leaving us scratching our heads. And, and, I, and I'll take you through that. Um, what is interesting was actually the fire behavior that occurred. And, and we have some real questions as to, as to why that behavior did occur the way it did. Okay, this was the, this was the most typical um, situation for, for these hot fires, where you had um, a thermocouple temperature shown here and time. So this is only 10 minutes. So this is a hot head fire running at that tower, maximum temperature about 550 at the bottom, 550 centigrade, um, and then uh, a little bit lower, about the same temperature at the middle, but maybe not quite sustained, and then a lower temperature at top, maxing at a little over 200 degrees on the thermocouples. Okay. Then the next tower back behind this was a bit more perplexing, but it, it made sense. There wasn't there wasn't a lot of crown consumption here, but there was some crown scorch, but it was a much flatter response of the temperatures. And again, you could see the top, middle, and bottom, um, but uh, again, a, a much longer time period. So again, about an 18-minute period here. So very different time behavior or different fire behavior, even though the fuels were pretty similar. Then this is the most perplexing, I think, where the top and the middle part to the left show a peak at about a little after four minutes, and then nothing for about eight or nine minutes, and then, a, and then the fuels at the bottom of the, of the tower burning, but no impact on the above canopy. And so either a crown nearby torch, and that affected it, but why there's no effect of, of a fairly hot fire at the bottom of the tower not impacting the other sensors, I don't know. This is, this is curious as to what, and this is, I think, giving us some, some ideas that fire behavior, even on a small block, is it can actually be quite variable. Okay, so then what we did is we went and looked, and this, this explained it pretty nicely. We went and looked at the fire line progression on the left and then the crown fuel consumption on the right. Um, and the crown fuel consumption is estimated from um, Nick's really nice LIDAR, light detection and ranging uh, work. And the fire line detection is from aerial flights with, a, with an IR sensor. And so... On the north tower, that made sense because that was, a, that was a crown run, and you can see on the left the amount of crown consumption that occurred then. So the fire is, is moving and it's accelerating through time. But why mid-block it deaccelerates, and right at that line between the west and the, and the, and the south towers, you can see that line there. Why, why it slowed down uh, is, or deaccelerated is, is pretty, pretty curious. The, the fire came back down on the ground, but then later took off again. And you can see there in the, on the figure on the right in the bottom corner, there's crown consumption again. And you can see that, that, that re-acceleration of the burn. And so I think we have our work cut out for us um, in terms of, of, of both understanding and modeling fire behavior. And we uh, have all of us who are going to be working on this really for the next five years, we've just received a, a fairly large um, 
grant to uh, to work on this to work and and this is a key problem because here it is right here why does this why does this occur and we can we can we can reconcile our data but but why indeed that actually did happen we're we're not really quite sure okay um, what I want to do now is I want to take a series of eight prescribed fires that we've been working on with the control and the fire towers, and I want to look for some predictive relationships between these. Are there, what do we understand? What don't we understand? What don't we get? And what does that tell us about fuel reduction treatments? And so the, the range of fires um, that I'm going to use here are a, a quite low-intensity fire in a pine, oak, almost oak dominate, or oak, well, oak and pine mix forest uh, near the Silas Little Experimental Forest in 2012, and then this much hotter Warren Grove burn in 2014. And so that's pretty much my range of fire behavior where there was some um, crown torching, uh, not exactly crowning behavior, but definitely some torching going on uh, and, and a lot of la ladder fuel consumption. Um, and so what I'm looking for is predictive relationships between the fuel consumption during the fire, um, maximum above canopy air temperature attributed to the fire. And so I'm looking at the difference between the control and the fire towers, the data collected there. And then something about, uh, I want to look at, at a, an estimate of, of the amount of turbulence. And I'm going to use a variable called turbulent kinetic energy attributed to the fire. And uh, Warren Heilman is actually a real expert in, in TKE and his group. Um, what it is is, is is turbulent kinetic energy. It's the kinetic energy associated with eddies and turbulent flow. And here, this is turbulent flow above canopies, and in particular induced by the buoyant plumes during the fires. And so it's it's sort of the way it's calculated, I didn't want to, we didn't need more equations, um, but it's, uh, it's, it's the variability in the three-dimensional uh, wind velocities. Uh, and, and, and so it, a nice estimate, a nice number to look at uh, in terms of uh, estimating turbulence. Okay, here's what the data looks like for those two different burns, um, sonic temperature, uh, shown on the y-axis on the top, and you can see the the the, 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 the 2012 Silas Little Burn hardly budged the sonic anemometer. So um, maybe about 25 degrees. These are these are one second averages. Whereas the the 2014 Warren Grove Burn much higher, almost uh, 100 degrees centigrade, um, getting up near 100 degrees centigrade. And then on the bottom, you can see the, the turbulent kinetic energy where there's hardly any additional turbulence from the fire uh, in the 2012 burn, whereas on, on, the, uh, on the panel in the lower right, a uh, considerable amount of additional turbulence um, in the burn block shown with the triangle. So a, a much larger increase in turbulence and turbulent kinetic energy because of the fire. Okay, some relation, some strong relationships between variables. So fuel loading is seems to always be, uh, uh, or, or fuel consumption is always a good um, uh, fuel loading is always a good predictor of fuel consumption. Is what I'm trying to say here, and so you can see these relationships are all significant, um, and they're all linear. So that basically, the higher the fuel loading for any of the surface fuels and, and understory loading, um, is 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 proportional to the amount of consumption during a burn. And we've seen this. This is just for the eight fires, but we've seen this on a much larger data set. We also see it within a burn block when we're very careful about our, our fuel measurement. And so, this seems to be a very strong relationship. Um, on the the panel. On the right, um, there is a relationship between maximum temperature, and this is that delta temperature, so this is the differential between the control and the burn tower, tower um, and the turbulent kinetic energy, so that the amount of turbulence, um, the difference between the control and the burn towers, 
there seems to be a significant relationship. And so the hotter it is, the more turbulent it is. That makes sense. Um, whether or not it's a linear relationship, I have it here as an exponential relationship, and that's significant. The linear relationship is significant, too. We just need to conduct more fires to basically understand this a, a little bit more. Um, hey, Amanda, are you still there? Yes. Okay. Well, maybe surprising, <laughs> here's where it falls apart. Um, the not strong relationships between some other variables. And one is that fuel consumption isn't related to the maximum temperature. And I think that, that was surprising. Um, I would have thought the more fuel that's consumed, and again, this is really what's coming back is the fire behavior, um, would would end up with much higher maximum temperatures in those burns, not necessarily. And even poorer is the relationship between fuel consumption and turbulent kinetic energy. There's basically no relationship between those. And so what that means is that, well, one, we have more work to do, but two, I think the good news is you don't have to burn like this to reduce a significant amount of hazardous fuel so that low-intensity burns are consuming a lot of the forest floor and a significant portion of understory vegetation. Um, so, of course, um, fires like this uh, are, are, will, will get fire managers uh, probably in hot water because there's a lot of dispersion of smoke during fires like this. Um, but, but, again, I mean, there's conditions where that would be warranted, where you might want to do conduct dry burns like that. Um, but for the most part, maybe not. And, and I think we, just, we, just, we really need to keep plugging away on, on the fire behavior work here uh, and, and, and to resolve some of these, uh, some, some of these relationships that, that I don't think we quite we don't understand as, as well as probably we should. Okay. I'm going to jump completely, uh, and I'm, I'm going to look at the second uh, uh, question here, um, the impact of, of uh, southern pine beetle and gypsy moth on hazardous fuel loads and fire danger. And uh, really the, the question I have here is, is how do invasive insects impact forest structure and fire danger? And I, I want to start teasing apart some of the mechanisms of the alterations to fuels and particularly the fire weather conditions on the forest floor. So, you know, are, are, are with the insect invasions that we have, are we going to expect higher fire danger and higher wildfire intensities in these, in these spans? Um, here's sort of the, the situation, at least in, in, the, uh, in the Pinelands, in the New Jersey Pinelands, is that the minimum nighttime air temperature during the winter has increased through time. And this graph on the upper right shows 1960 to 2012, um, right, right before the polar vortex. Um, but there's definitely a trend in increasing uh, uh, minimum nighttime temperatures. And what that's doing is that's driving lower mortality of southern pine beetles. The so southern pine beetles here in low numbers and has been here for a long time, but it's starting to build up larger and larger populations because of less wintertime mortality. And this picture on the lower right is an overflight picture in, in uh, the southern part of the state, and it shows extensive mortality of, of pine trees. Um, the trees in the middle with the red needles are dead. The, the margins, the yellowing margins are dying, and this looks like just a, just a complete fire hazard. But what happens is this red, this is called a red needle phase. This red needle phase is actually quite short-lived in pitch pine. So once they die, they drop those needles pretty fast. Um, but then what happens is you can see in the picture on the left is, uh, is kind of a real mess where there's, where there's a lot of coarse fuels on the forest floor. Now that the forest is opened up so there's much higher light uh, in the forest floor. The tree right in front is dead. Um, it hasn't fallen yet. Um, and uh, 
so what we wanted to do is, with uh, the help of uh, um, forest health and monitoring program, um, we started putting in spots in, in impacted areas. We looked at treatment um, as well as natural stands. This is a natural stand where nobody's done anything. Um, and we put in forest census plots to look at trees, saplings, uh, any regeneration and understory, and what the impact of, uh, of this defoliation was, was to these. Um, and here you can see it is that this is a density in basal area, a meter squared per hectare, of pines, oaks, and hardwood. And I've compared control stands to SPD stands, to southern pine beetle stands. And it's about 90% mortality of the pine, but little impact on overstory oaks and hardwood. This, again, was all treatments together. The blue arrow indicates a critical density for SPD. And what that is is at about 18 meters squared um, per hectare, that's a critical density of trees where southern pine beetle can really get going in that dense of forest. And unfortunately, about 64% of the pine stands and the pine barrens are at that density and above. Um, so that uh, a, you know a good portion of the of the of the pine barrens is certainly at risk for southern pine beetle. Um, the there's also going to be an impact on future forests, and this is live sapling shown on the bottom, um, where again pine basal area is significantly reduced and not really that much of an effect uh, on the oaks, and maybe a little effect on the hardwoods, although it's not significant. Um, so that. Uh, what we're, just, we're seeing high pine mortality in these stands. Um, if we look at above ground biomass, and here's what I've done: I've just I've just taken out the pines, um, and I've compared trees and then saplings in terms of above ground biomass, and then on the bottom of, of available crown fuels in these stands. So in these impacted stands, um, really have reduced uh, crown fuels. Now, initially we thought there would be a lot of regeneration, of seedling regeneration, because now these are open stands. But it turns out that's not the case, is that it looks like places that have not really been particularly disturbed, um, like along roads, the cut roads, or uh, where they've done uh, cut chip treatments. Um, and in natural stands, we found very little pine regeneration. The only place we have seen significant regeneration was this year. We started working on uh, um, cut and chip stands where they actually came in and really disturbed the litter layer uh, in some areas. And we've seen um, a significant amount of pine regeneration there. But other than that, and in natural stands, very little regeneration. The shrubs are dense. The forest floor is, is relatively intact. Um, we thought we might see an increase of the forest floor, but it turned out that when these trees died, they died so rapidly that the needles that they dropped were actually had high nutrients in them, and they've actually decomposed more rapidly than, than uh, 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 regular pine needles, or pine needles that usually fall. So the forest floors actually decrease also. Um, sort of the last thing we've done, this is some neat work we've been doing with Mike. Uh, Mike and I have been, been working on this, and um, we've been looking at uh, understory changes um, and on forest floor changes to, uh, to meteorological variables. Or how does the microclimate get impacted by stands that open up? And in this case, this tower is actually at Silas Little, and this is uh, looking at the, the effect of southern, of a, sorry, of gypsy moss impacting oak and what that's done to the open the stand up and uh, what happens uh, with some of the, uh, the, the fire weather variables. And so some trends are that there's higher. Uh, uh, temperatures on the forest floor uh, during the day, there's lower humidity levels, there's higher wind speeds near the forest floor, but there's also higher precipitation because now there's not a canopy to intercept the rainfall. So overall what's happening is it just there's, there's an increased fuel moisture dynamic. Um, so we're starting to, to uh, put together a, a, a model to look at this um, using uh, this series of, of overstory and then now these new understory towers. Um, but it's uh, basically what's happening is things are, 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 are just more dynamic under these stands. All righty. Well, <clears throat> get ready because uh, this isn't just our problem. 
Um, this is coming to a pine forest near you in the near future, I'm afraid to say. Um, this is the most recent uh, surveys, both ground and aerial surveys. These are uh, gr uh, ground surveys shown in red and aerial surveys shown in yellow of uh, southern pine beetle uh, impacted stands in Long Island uh, in the, uh, the central pine barrens of, of, of Long Island. And um, I think that about the only thing southern now in southern pine beetle is its name, unfortunately. Um, if you think about it, the combined impacts of southern pine beetle, of gypsy moth, of emerald ash borer, and of, 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 woolly, of, of the hemlock woolly adelgid is that these are orders of magnitude more damage, more damage to forest acreage than, than wildfire or prescribed burns. But they're also having a significant impact on the structure of all these forests. And so in the future, it's, it's sort of like a, the new forest. And so it's going to be very interesting to see how all these insects play out. And when this big feeding frenzy is over with, what, what we're left with is going to be very interesting in terms of fire dynamics on this landscape. All right, I've got one more thing to talk about, and that is some very nice work of that Mike's been doing with remote sensing methods to evaluate fire severity and uh, tree mortality in pine forests. Um, and uh, we have this very nice wildfire history of southern New Jersey. I know Inga worked on this some, and, uh, and it, with New Jersey Forest Fire Service, and they've been just great on putting this together. Um, and this is, this is just a real resource. Uh, again, the, the, the wildfires from... Uh, 1924 to 2011 very nicely uh, put together uh, digitally but it's actually only part of the story and it's only part of the story because of this where there's actually great variation in crown fuel consumption and that's shown at a at large scale this is a lidar image that Nick put together um, after the, the 2007 Warren Grove wildfire where in the center of that image you can see these runs and, and basically areas where there was just uh, needle scores, but not not needle uh, mortality. There wasn't very high mortality. There's areas where wetlands have blocked some of the fires, um, and basically across the landscape, there's just great variability in both crown fuel consumption, but also in mortality of trees um, following that. And you can, on the on the right, you can see that on a small scale too. And this is a, a different burn, but it's similar to that image that we looked at before, where even in a small area, there's, there's a large amount of variability of crowning um, and of crown damage and of mortality. And so Mike's been concerned about this, and so he started mapping and quantifying fire effects. Um, he hand digitizes some of the fire maps from New Jersey Forest Fire Service um, and then has integrated those with, uh, with process satellite imagery. And I'm just going to take you through this really quickly. Um, here's what his processing steps look, look at. And so what he's doing is he's comparing pre-burn at the top and post-burn at the bottom imagery um, from uh, Landsat uh, satellites. Uh, and what they're, what they're giving him is the difference between red and far red. And that comes back to what we looked at for the energy balance, where the red light is actually what's absorbed by photosynthesis, so that's proportional to, or sorry, what's absorbed by chlorophyll, so that's proportional to leaf area, and then the sensible heat flux or the infrared radiation that's given off from the stand, and that's proportional to the sensible heat flux. So we, we've seen how this works at the energy balance level, um, and here's the way that it works uh, actually uh, at, the, at, at the satellite scale. And so um, Mike is figuring out how to put these together, and he's calculating something called a, a, a relative difference to normalized burn ratio. Okay. Well, so he can work out spatially the intensity of a fire, uh, of, of both prescribed burns and wildfires. Um, he's lined that up now with uh, um, almost 134 census plots uh, located on top of those burns. And so he's gone through and he's figured out what trees are, have, are, are living, which, which have died, uh, 
as a proportion uh, or as a function of the uh, the fire intensity. Um, and so, if you think about it this way, a certain number of these trees died, and probably the smaller ones died, the larger ones continue to live. So there was a certain amount of mortality in a hot fire like this, but which ones were they? And so this is, this is what, it's quite exciting, this is what Mike has, has been working on. And uh, this is just some uh, uh, modeling that he's done. He's done some work with Bill Zipsy, uh, with uh, New Jersey DEP, um, and they're about 92% correct in how they can predict the tree mortality um, they do a little bit better with uh, with live with live trees, um, and they're still working on improving the predictions for dead trees. But they're getting pretty close. Um, and one thing that they've noted is that the greater intensity fire is the higher diameter of trees that die. So in high uh, intensity fires, the 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 sort of uh, tree the larger diameter trees are dying. And with that. I would like to thank you all for tuning in. This is us three on a day that probably is not going to burn, um, but uh, there we are. And with that, if I can take any questions, I'd be happy to. Great, Ken. Thank you so much for that really awesome presentation. Um, so just as a reminder, folks, if you have questions on anything that Ken's presented, um, then you can type a question into the chat box, and we're going to address those questions first. And then we'll open up the phone lines after that um, to, take, to take questions. Um, so, Ken, you had one question from Nick, and I would concur with this very good question. Um, he says, would more pine overstory mortality induced from intense prescribed burning reduce the risk of southern pine beetle by reducing the stem density? And he put sorry in parentheses. No, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. It probably does, because if that pulls us below that density, uh, that critical density uh, of about 18 uh, meters um, uh, squared per hectare, then we're in lower density stands. Um, thinning has been shown to work in the south also, and that may actually work here. Um, certainly, uh, Bob Williams would be an advocate of that, uh, that kind of treatment. Um, so, no, that's a good question, and, and it probably would work. Um, one of the one of the problems with that is, is what, so what do you what do you do with that wood then, um, so that and this, this sort of comes down to the fact that um, we haven't really been very good at developing markets for these wood products. So that these thinnings or prescribed burns or things like that, uh, you know, not so much prescribed burns, but any sort of thinning treatment is, is expensive um, unless we can get it to pay for itself. Uh, but uh, no, good question, Nick. Yeah, it would work. It would help. Great. Thank you, Ken. All right, Kevin Dodds has a question. He says, the effects of gypsy moss defoliation on understory conditions you mentioned would seem to have a negative influence on southern pine beetle host finding and mass aggregation on pine. Have you seen any evidence of less southern pine beetle activity in, in gypsy moss defoliated stands? I, I have not seen the interaction so much. But I think we might see it in the future. And the reason being is because the stands where there was significant gypsy moth defoliation had previously been fairly high uh, oak density. Um, and so the, the, the pine density wasn't high enough, I think, for the southern pine beetle populations to, to build up. Um, I think in the future, say after there's a significant amount of pine regeneration in those oak stands, then I think it might be a, might be a problem. But, but uh, yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. And that, th th these, of course, as Kevin points out, I mean, these, 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 these disturbances are interacting with each other. Um, and really the, the question is uh, um, you know, how and, 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 and what are going to be the outcomes? And that's, so that's, that's a really good question. Yeah. Um, let's see. Thank you. So, so Faith had a quick question. Um, the power to answer that the PowerPoint will be available online. Um, actually, the PDF of the PowerPoint is already available online, and a recording of this webinar um, will also be on the North Atlantic Fire Science Exchange website, firesciencenorthatlantic.org. Um, Dave Hollinger says 
great presentation. Is the southern pine beetle spreading into other northern species on Long Island? Uh, so far, it's just pines. Um, but I, I, I think I think in the future the concern is going to be jackpot. Mm. Um, you know, with climate change, there's a lot of pines up north, um, and so far we've it's been detected in both New Hampshire and Connecticut, and uh, um, but I don't know about the impacts there yet. I don't know if if they have a program actually. Uh, um, Long Island has a has a very aggressive program right now uh, to try to deal with it because they want to they want to do what New Jersey did here, which was to try to isolate the big outbreaks. Um, but we we got a, a sort of a break from it in the last two cold winters, and so this winter, I mean, this winter has been much warmer, and so we'll we'll see what happens. Um, but Dave, not that I know of. I don't know that it's gotten to other coniferous species. I think it's mostly it's pretty pretty uh, uh, pretty much just ponds. Yeah, I've seen some some other comments down here. So yeah, Dave Hollinger asked about what about white pine, and Kevin Dodds also said uh, we found it in white pine, Scots red, and a few Norway spruce. Um, and oh, Adele Fenwick okay. asked uh, jack pine and red pine also question mark. Um, good, great questions. I may have to defer to to Matt Ayers and the Dartmouth crew because they know a lot more about southern pine beetle than I do. Um, but uh, I will ask. Yeah, and Kevin followed up with white pine. It has not been very successful. Um, before mm -hmm. I jump back to Helen's question, uh, Kathy, who's on Long Island, says, Dave, I have seen southern pine beetle in some individual white pines, but it hasn't yet had the same impacts in white pine as pitch pine. So that would be on Long Island. Um, I'm going to jump back to Helen's question. She says, what is the cost associated with building the flux towers? <laughs> um, it's it's not too bad. And again, um, it's... Uh, it's how fancy you want it you, you would like to get. If you're doing things like putting in line power to them, um, you can you're looking at probably fifty or sixty thousand um, dollars. some of these temporary ones, I think we're probably building these for um, probably less than ten thousand dollars without you know, with with just the sonic animometer, data logger, the thermocouples, the fire ones. If you start to add things like CO2 measurements and water vapor measurements, um, that probably adds another fifteen to, to twenty thousand for the instrumentation for that, um, and then maybe another uh, five to ten thousand for meteorological equipment, um, depending on, on you know what what you want to do. Um, but I'd say I mean fifty thousand would be would be a, a pretty reasonable estimate for these. All right, and I think Nick was commenting on the uh, the cost, and he says it is measured in blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> so that, that may be the case. Yeah. Um, all right, next question. Uh, Jane Foster says, have you had recent gypsy moth activity? Uh, we have not seen very much in the southern part of the state, but the northern part of the state, yes, where um, – and, and actually uh, – Todd might be able to address this a little better, but um, um, something on the order of uh, of, of 300,000 acres were defoliated by by gypsy moth up north this year, um, and I expect that probably to be down here within the next few years. And so, you know, it's sort of another round of of gypsy moth defoliation, um, which for us caused about 20 to 25 percent. Of the over the large overstory oak mortality, with with that was with repeated defoliation through a number of years, but a lot of mortality associated with gypsy moth. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure we'll all be keeping our eyes on the critters in the forest. Um, yeah. Steve Holmes asks a good question: Would prescribed burning in a southern pine beetle site create enough ground disturbance to help in the regeneration of saplings? Yes. I, I think it would. I think that would help a lot. Right. I mean that, and that comes back to some really some some in, information that Silas Little had collected, and that's what he was trying to do 
Um, he was trying to reduce fire intensity by reducing hazardous fuels, but he was also trying to regenerate pines. And so the, the, the uh, historic literature uh, that, that, that Silas Little worked on uh, would, 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 would back that up, I think. So, so Steve, yeah, that would work. Great. Um, so Nick, oh, oh, here comes another question. Great. Um, Adele says, from your canopy temp measurements, what effect do you think that would have on insect populations if you were burning in stands with red pine scale? Hmm. Good question, and I, I, I don't know the answer to that one because I don't, I don't know that not, um, very much about red pine scale and when it would be out, but uh, that's a good question. I have to get Matt Ayers on the line. Um, if you if, can, we save these questions because I can I can pass these on. Yeah, yeah. All the questions will definitely be saved. Okay. All right. So I'll I'll try to get information. Ah, the yeah, an answer may be coming. Bill Patterson says it depends on upon the degree of canopy opening. Regeneration of pitch pine depends on crown cover of less than about thirty yeah. percent. Yeah. Yeah, All right. Yeah. So we are just coming up to the top of the hour. I know some folks might need to go. Um, I'd like to give Nick and Mike a chance to um, speak up and say anything that they'd like to. Um, and folks can keep putting questions into the chat box. Um, after Nick or Mike comment or decline to comment, then I will open up the phone lines um, if, if folks who can stick around for another minute or two have a question. Um, so Nick or Mike, do you have anything to add or, um, or comments on uh, Ken's presentation? I, I don't have anything to add. Uh, great job, Ken. Um, you know, there's there's uh, this is, there's a lot of things that are going on here. Ken definitely did a great job trying to get as much as he could packed into this uh, presentation. So uh, I do want to uh, just thank uh, everybody, all of our cooperators and collaborators that have helped make this this all happen. It's, there's a lot of moving parts to this work, and it wouldn't happen without without everybody uh, supporting us. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for listening too. Great. Thanks. All right. Any last thoughts here? I just second what Nick said, and, and thanks to our collaborators. Okay, great. Thank you. So let's see. So it's a minute after one. If I see questions in the chat box, we can take them. Um, if folks need to jump off, you're perfectly welcome to. I'm going to unmute the participant lines. Um, so if folks have questions or if you want to start a conversation uh, about Southern Pine Beetle or anything continuing, um, then you can do that. So. Um, I just want to say thanks again to Ken and to Nick and Mike for all your work, um, and I'll unmute the phone lines and uh, say you know thanks again for folks uh, to folks for for joining us today. Um, so if folks have questions, feel free to stick around. Um, otherwise, thank you, and this will be posted on the North Atlantic Fire Science Exchange website. All right, unmuting. Okay, so if anyone has questions um, for Ken, um, please feel free to go ahead and ask. I hope that unmute worked. Also, if anybody wants them, I can, uh, you can, you can email me questions too, and I will try to answer them, and I will at least route them to people who really are in the know. I know that for the Southern Pine Beetle, Matt Ayers is, uh, is in uh, Costa Rica right now, but he's coming back, and, and he really is the world expert on some of these invasive insects, and he would be very helpful, uh, I think. Um, he's worked a lot with Forest Fire Service and with us, um, so we... We, uh, we really benefit from that uh, interaction, uh, that's for sure. Great, thank you. Anyone else have questions you want to say over the phone line? Let's see, we have one more question in the chat box. Um, John says, your heat flux data was generated in essentially flat pinelands habitat. Would you expect substantial changes in the effectiveness of prescribed burning due to increased preheating and increased fire activity in more aggressive topography? I'm concerned about eastern hardwoods in northern New Jersey. Good question. Yeah. 
I'm yeah, reading your, I'm reading your question, John. Um, I I, um, I know it's 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 off topic, but um, I think it's uh, amazing how you were able to generate this data. Uh, I'm I'm wondering if topography would have skewed it. Uh, thankfully, Pinelands is essentially flat, so yeah. I'm, I, I I've never seen a study like this done in topography. I can only assume that a station at the top of a hill would uh, measure data. Um, at a, at a higher level of uh, turbulence and heat. I just wondered if, if anyone has ever done a study to equate those temperatures and, uh, with successes and failures in, in up uh, versus down slopes. So, John, yeah. can you mind if, I, mind if I jump on? Yeah, please do. So, so this is Nick. Um, and, and so the, a lot of this stuff was, is really you know, designed to get at sort of fundamental um, physics that are happening within the fire environment. And so you're completely right. Uh, that topography adds a sort of another level to the complexity of the problem that we're trying to solve. And one of the wonderful things about the Pine Barrens is that it's, you know, it's a pool table. It's, it's perfectly flat. So if you think about the, the, the fire behavior triangle, you know, fuels, weather, topography, we can essentially take that topography out of the equation. And it really, uh, it really helps us to, 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 to provide the data for model validation that we're really after. You know, we're trying to work on sort of generating these next, dimension, or next generation fire behavior models. And so if we can pull that out, it's sort of one of our strengths in, the, in, in our area to get into the sort of the fire model and, and uh, physics game. Um, and that, adding that topography makes things, you know, just thinking about the buoyancy of the plume and, and all the preheating that's going to happen with that, it's, it's, you're, you're, you're spot on. It, it adds so much complexity and yeah, you're probably going to see a lot more preheating in that situation. Uh, great I, question. I would, yeah, I would think so too. And I would, this is Ken, I would think that uh, the another difference, of course, is, is soil particle size and the propagation of that heat into the soil. I mean, I think you were asking primarily about litter layer um, changes, um, but if you have, like, if it's especially if it's rocky at all, or or you know you, you have these different different slope angles, which means that there's different accumulation of litter in each of those slopes. I mean, it's it, it's much more complex. Whereas our our fuel, at least our forest floor fuel beds, are actually pretty uniform. Um, the other thing that saves us is exactly what Nick talked about. That flatness allows you to interpret the turbulent statistics with a lot more confidence. Because if you have slopes on um, complex terrain, it's so difficult to try and work out what turbulence is actually doing in that environment. I mean, that's, that's pushed some very smart people to uh, <laughs> the peers probably trying to figure that one out. I hear that. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. All right. We have another question on a different thread. Uh, we have a Stockton student who is asking if there's a way for students to become more involved in the prescribed burns. Betty, why don't you email us if you're still on? All right. Well, you probably noticed one of my opening slides. We had, uh, you probably saw it, uh, Dr. George Zimmerman in there um, at, from Stockton University. He is a, a huge fan of getting students out in the woods learning about fire, fire ecology, um, and all things related to that in the sciences. So, uh, yeah, talk, talk to Dr. Zimmerman. Um, and, uh, and as Ken said, just go ahead and email, and uh, we'll see, see what we can do to get you out on a fire. We're, our exchange yeah. strongly encourages student uh, ac activity. <laughs> All right, other questions? Yeah, absolutely. Excellent presentation. Thanks so much. All right, thank you for joining thanks. us. Yeah, thanks very much, everybody. All right. All right. Um, we're a few minutes after the hour, so I think we could probably safely sign off. Um, again, we will post a recording of this presentation on the North Atlantic Fire Science Exchange website. And I think we'll work with Inga to get uh, maybe responses to some of these questions uh, also linked to that uh, presentation. So 
thanks everybody very much for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon. All right. Hey, thanks, Amanda. Hey, thank you, Ken. This is great. Thanks for all the help. That was really cool. Yeah. All right. I will uh, I'll send you these questions as a follow up, but thank okay. you. This is fantastic. Okay. Well, good deal. Well, they, and thanks again for, uh, you know, for hanging in there and uh, taking me through this on, uh, what was that, on Tuesday. That was really helpful because it really worked smoothly. Good. All, all right. right. Well, I think it's coffee time. <laughs> Yep, sounds good. Time to time to close out. Okay, thanks, Amanda. Okay, thanks, Ken. Hey, Amanda, good job. Thank you. Hey, good job, okay, Ken. Okay, thank you.